go. Welcome again, and we're excited tonight to have with us Patricia Skelka, author of the Dave Kubiak Mystery Series set in Door County. And this event is sponsored by the Bruce Jungerberg family in loving memory of Susan Jungerberg, who enjoyed a good mystery. So thank you, Bruce, for that. We're so happy to have you and your friends here and uh, Patricia. And I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to mute everybody except Patricia and um, let her take it away. And then we'll save some time at the end for your questions. And if you have a question and you think you might forget about it, you can go down to the bottom of your screen and chat and type it in and we will all see it and help uh, remind Patricia to answer it at the end. So take it away, Patricia. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you for inviting me to be here and for setting this up so we can do it um, long distance rather than in person. And thank you everybody else for, for tuning in and, and spending a little bit of your evening um, with the library and with me and with everybody else. Um, my background is that of a nonfiction writer before I turned to writing fiction. I was a staff writer for the Reader's Digest for about 20 years. I was um, a freelance writer for a number of different publications, both um, print publications and online publications. I did a couple of nonfiction books, and it was a great experience. I mean, I interviewed Barbara Bush in the Yellow Room of the White House. I interviewed Robert Butler, the former head of the National Institutes of Health, in his kitchen on a Friday evening while he sat on a stool and ate a cup of yogurt, and his children ran around because we were supposed to meet earlier in the day and he had to keep canceling because of meetings. I interviewed Fred Rogers in his studio and got to see him interact with children, which was an amazing, amazing experience. I mean, the man was totally genuine. But most of my experience as a nonfiction writer was spent sitting in people's living rooms and at their kitchen tables, talking about their lives, their traumas, their struggles, their experiences. I did mostly human interest and medical type stories. Um, so there was always the human element. And it served me well when I turned to fiction because uh, exposure to lots of different kinds of people. Uh, sometimes I did as told to books or stories or articles. So I had to like really pay attention to the way people spoke because when I wrote in for them, it had to sound like them. And, um, you know, when you're doing dialogue in fiction, then it, it comes in handy to have a, a little bit of a, a sense of, of different ways that, that people present themselves. Um, also, lots of different experiences, you know, traveled to a lot of different places and did a lot of different things. So when I turn, when I just, I always wanted to be a fiction writer. It's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a novelist. But in the meantime, you know, I had to make some money and, you know, do something where, where I would get paid on a regular basis. So I did the nonfiction and then at, I started writing fiction and I wrote some, some short stories that were terrible and are still sitting in a drawer somewhere because that's probably where they should stay forever. And then um, I wrote a couple of, I wrote the first draft of the Dave Kubiak mystery and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. It was a very, very long process between the time I started and the time I finished, or I finally got it published. Um, books start with an idea. Just, that's it. You get an idea about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened or if that happened? And the idea either has to, it has to hold a lot of water because you go from your idea, which is expressed in maybe a sentence or two, and by the time you finish your manuscript, you're at 74,000 words. There's a lot has to happen between the, the getting the idea and the finishing the manuscript. Um, when you write a fiction book, especially a mystery, there are three elements. You have the place, which is the setting. You have your characters or the people and the action or the plot. Uh, all three of those are in there and they have to be in there and sometimes there's more emphasis on one or the other and sometimes the idea for the whole book will come from one or, or the other of those and what i wanted to do this evening is kind of walk through the five books that exist right now in the series talk about where the ideas for them came from and and how i proceeded from there and then a little bit about um 
you know, my whole, how, how I do this, how I, my approach to it. Um, so each of the books, although they're the same, you know, it's a series, every single one of them had a different um, seed or source of inspiration. So we'll start with book one, which is Death Stalks Dark County. This book grew from Dark County. It grew from the setting. I was there one time, this was a long time ago, I told you it took me a long time to get that first one done, um, sitting on the beach on the Lake Michigan shore on one of those days where if you could have bottled it and sold it, whatever you had in that bottle, you'd make a million dollars. It was at absolutely spectacular of a day. That very same night, I was sitting in the same spot. Now, if you're on the shore of Lake Michigan and there's a full moon, you can almost read the newspaper. I mean, it's so bright. You see shadows, it's, it's fantastic. Well, that night, there was no moon and there was a heavy cloud cover, so there was no starlight. And it was so dark that, you know, your hand here, you couldn't see it. And there was a rustling behind me in the bushes and I thought it was kind of eerie. I kept looking over my shoulder like, mm, what's back there? And I thought, you know, anything could happen here. Like, like maybe something not really good could happen here. And so it got me thinking about the contrast between, you know, the day and the night, um, dark and light, good and evil. And that's, that's where the whole idea came from. I thought this is the perfect setting for a mystery because you have this travel brochure veneer of perfection and then sinister forces at work under the surface. That's the idea. How do I make that idea into a book? Well, um, what are the sinister forces? Who's responsible for them? What, what's, what's behind it? Um, I like to read books, mysteries, where whatever happens at the present time is connected to something that's happened years ago, decades ago, eight eons ago even sometimes. So that's what I wanted for my first book. And I should start by saying I had no intention of writing a series. When I thought of a series, I thought of Sue Grafton and, you know, this endless 26, I thought I can't do that. It's so intimidating. So I was going to write what's known as a one and done, a standalone. And there are plenty of them out there and they're great mysteries. So that's where I was headed when I first started. As I you know, as I said, I, I had these had to, had to have these sinister forces at work beneath the surface. But that, when you write a mystery, the question is always, why and what if and what if and what if and what if and what's next and how does this all come together? So I was plotting it out and talked to the sheriff. Got some insight from the sheriff that was very useful, and eventually managed to cobble together those 74,000 words and get a publisher, which is the University of Wisconsin Press. And they have been absolutely wonderful to work with. So the story grew and grew. And as I was writing it, I started getting ideas for other books. So I very cleverly thought, well, I will do four and there'll be one a season, you know, like, you know, how, how, <laughs> how unique is that? Um, but now I just finished book five. I just finished book six, actually. It's at the publisher now. So, you know, more ideas kept coming. So this, it's moving along. The um, interesting thing about the book Death Stalks is that Door County is a community where people really know each other. And there, there are families there that go back for generations. And that was an issue for me because I thought, you know, if, if I have some local person who's working on solving this crime, they're going to figure it out really quickly because they're going to know, uh, you know, the, the old grudges, the old things that were done that wrong, where people, somebody wronged somebody else, and the, maybe the subtle feuds. They would know about these sinister forces beneath the surface. So I needed a protagonist who didn't know anything about Door County, hence Dave Kubiak. And he comes in from Chicago. He's a former homicide cop. He has come to escape death. He's had enough of it. He is burdened with grief and guilt over the loss of his wife and daughter who die in an accident he thinks he should have prevented. And um, I mean, the man is, is, he's kind of, a, he's in bad shape. Uh, he's he, he's retrained as a ranger, so he's working. He's not even working in law enforcement, but he's the one who can figure it out. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but that's why, that's why my protagonist had to come in from the outside. And as he is figuring it out, hopefully he's taking the reader along in the process. You know, one, linking one thing to another, of what is actually going on here? Why are these people dying? The second book, Death at Gill's Rock, is based initially just on the sense of the characters. I very much wanted to do a book that had um, World War II veterans in it because it was a population that was fast disappearing. My dad was a vet, my uncles were vets, my Aunt Louise, my godmother lied about her age, you know, so she could enlist in the waves. And so, you know, I, I wanted to do something with, with that whole era of a group of people. And in order to make the story work, there's always a glitch, right? So in order to make the story work, I needed three veterans who grew up in a, an isolated village, hence Gills Rock, who all enlisted at the same time, were in the same branch of the military, and all served in the same place without a lot of coincidences piling on top of each other, because that always ruins it for the reader. And I wasn't sure how I was going to make that happen. One day I was talking to, um, I have a cottage up there, so I spend a lot of time up there. And I was talking to one of my beach neighbors and I was kind of saying, you know, I have this dilemma. I don't know how to make this work. And she said, the entire Sturgeon Bay Coast Guard contingent served in the Aleutian Islands. I thought, well, bingo. That solves my problem right there. So I had these three teenage boys, one of them lying about his age, just like my Aunt Louise did. And they enlisted in the Coast Guard, Sturgeon Bay, and they were all shipped to the Aleutian Islands. Um, as a nonfiction writer, I had to do a lot of research for the medical stories or other kinds of pieces that I did. And here I am figuring out or, you know, what the heck did the Aleutian Islands have to do with World War II? I had a vague idea. I knew where they were. Uh, I didn't know how far, I didn't know that they extended almost to a thousand, within a thousand miles of Japan. And I almost got lost down the rabbit hole of research because, boy, you find out a lot of interesting things about, you know, the Coast Guard, the military, etc. But I also interviewed the um, head of the Coast Guard station in Sturgeon Bay and got a lot of good information about you know, just the whole background of ships and everything. So that story grew from the characters. You know, obviously there's a plot. There's a, you know, somebody dies. And in, in this instance, it starts with the death of these three heroes, these three men, um, right before they're going to be honored for their, for their service. And, and the whole story unrolls from there why, who, who, who was responsible, and of course it links to something back from the past. So then we move to the third book, Death in Cold Water, which you notice has a nice little shiny gold emblem on it, and it won the Edna Ferber Literary Book Award from the Council for Wisconsin Writers, and that nice little emblem means that both the story and the writing got a nice, you know, pad of approval. So I was very pleased by that and very proud of it. Death in Cold Water grew from the plot. So I have the first book grew from the setting, the second book grew from the characters, book three came from the plot. I had this idea of someone, now I don't know who yet, someone makes a deathbed wish Obviously, someone, someone who's very elderly, who's had some horrendous experience back in, in the day. And friends, relatives, probably relatives, um, several, you know, one or two generations removed, decide to fulfill that deathbed wish for this person. The whole story. That, that was it. Who are they? What happened? Uh, who, who are the people who are going to, you know, commit the crime? Um, who's the crime committed against? I mean, those are all the pieces that have to kind of be figured out. And it takes a lot of just walking around and thinking about it. How's this going to make sense? Is this, you know, this going to work? Is that going to work? And, and the story just slowly kind of evolves. What's interesting 
I think, about death and cold water is that there are actually two plots. So the one follows the line of, of what had happened years back, and it someone disappears, have they been kidnapped, have they just you know gone off on a whatever. Um, so that's one storyline. The other storyline is about old human bones that wash up on the beach just north of Bailey's Harbor. Um, for this book, I interviewed the FBI. And that was a story in and of itself because I didn't think I wanted to talk to the FBI. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had a lot of experience talking to people, interviewing people, but somehow the notion of contacting the FBI and saying, hey, you know, um, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna end up with a file on me or something. So I finally decided, no, no, I have to do this. So I sent an email to the public information officer of the office, the FBI office in Milwaukee, which made sense. My books are set in Wisconsin. Told him who I was, what I was doing. And I got this prompt response informing me that all inquiries from the media, which I guess included me, had to go through Washington, D.C. I thought, oh, I don't know about this. You know, again, it's like, do I really want to contact the FBI and, you know, kind of draw any attention to myself? Um, finally, I thought, no, 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 you have to do this. So I sent my email to the public information officer in Washington, D.C. at the FBI. And they said, well, what, what are your questions? Well, I had you know, a zillion questions, but I gave them five. Told them kind of what I was working on. And they set me up with two agents at the regional office in Chicago. Now, we live in an age of electronics, right? You have cell phones, you have laptops, you have tablets, and you have little mini recorders. And when you talk to people at the FBI, you don't use any of those. You go through a gatehouse, and if you have any of these electronic gizmos with you, you leave them in the gatehouse, and you go in with a pen and a pad of paper, and that's it. And I thought, oh, how am I going to do this? So I plotted out my questions. I had a, a yellow pad, you know, those old-fashioned, you know what these are, and I had like a question, and then I'd leave a bunch of blank space so I could write things down, and then my next question, and more space. And I had page after page after page after this. And I just walked them through the story. And one of the agents had worked on a similar case with a small town sheriff in Michigan. He was perfect. I mean, they really did set me up to talk with someone who, who could answer every single question. And what I thought was just amazing was when, and they spent like two hours with me. Um, at the end, I'm thanking them and they thanked me. And I, I was puzzled by this. And they said, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people just make it all up. We're really glad you came in to talk to us. So it, it was a very interesting experience. They turned out to be great, very helpful. And um, the other interesting thing was that the, the one guy was, he was really handsome, tall man, and, and just dressed to the nines. And I, I couldn't help it. I said, you know, when you're out in the field, what do you wear? Um, and he said, unless I'm working underground and crawling around through the, through the, you know, the brush, he said, this is how I go to work. So I had my guy come in, like, you know, dressed to the nines. And of course, it's the day Kubiak comes in looking like, you know, he just rolled out of the haystack or something. So they get off on a real, you know, negative kind of, you know, looking at each other thinking, who are you? Um, it all gets resolved in the end. And of course, guess who solves the case? Not the FBI guy. Uh, <laughs> And then we move to book four, Death Rides the Ferry. This one, you notice, also has a nice little gold emblem on it. And this came from the, it's the Midwest Book Award from last year. And it was from the independent publishers in the Midwest, which is like considered a 16 state area. So again, it was supposedly, the, it was considered by them the best mystery published by, in their group of publishers that year. So I was very pleased with that. This is the book that almost never got written. The ferry refers to the ferry that goes from the tip of the peninsula, the Dark County Peninsula, to Washington Island. I've been on that ferry zillions of times. 
never occurred to me to use the fairy in a book. I have no idea why. Um, so we have a book that came from the setting. We have a book that came from the characters. We have a book that came from the plot. This book came in a sense from the setting because I'm on the ferry with my daughter who looks at me and says, mom, you know, it's like, mm, what did I do now? <laughs> she said, death on the ferry. And I just looked at this kid and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, <laughs> you know, just, she just put it right there. And I, and, but again, here, here, someone hands you this idea, death on the ferry, who dies? Why? Were they going to Washington Island? Were they coming from Washington Island? Does anybody else die? And of course, who's responsible for this? And how do I connect it to something that happened from the past? So I have this like brand new idea that my daughter hands to me as I'm standing there gazing out to, you know, at, this, at the water and, and, and the sky. And I decided that I would have a music festival on Washington Island. And somehow, somehow everything is going to, you know, fall into place. But what kind of music festival? They have all kinds of them there all the time. So the idea for using the ferry was the new idea. Way back when, when this same young woman, my daughter, was in preschool, one of um, the other parents who became a good friend of mine, she was a professional violinist. And one day she told me over a glass of wine about something called the viola da gamba, which is an instrument used in early music. I had no idea what she's talking about. But she said that at the time, she was married to a gentleman who played the viola da gamba. He was like one of about 100 people in the country who were doing it. It's, it's become more popular again now, it kind of goes in waves. Um, and I thought, wow, that is so cool. I wanna do something with that at some point. I didn't know ever when or how or what. So I took the new idea that my daughter gave me about a body on the ferry. And I took this very old idea that had been, or an idea that had been given to me like, you know, 20 some years ago about the viola da gamba. More research. Viola da gamba is the history, everything. I got to make up a story about this great yellow viol <laughs> that of course never existed, sort of like the red violin, but it was my version. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun doing that. So again, there has to be a snafu, right? The story hinges to a certain extent, you know, because as the plot goes along, it gets more and more complicated. Obviously there was this ancient viol that was involved in whatever happened years back. Um, I had this idea of how someone would listen to a recording from then and compare it to a recording from now and, and make an important connection in the plot. So I talked to a sound engineer, an acoustics guy, from, and he, he, said, nah, doesn't, he said it doesn't work that way. And I was like crushed. I thought, well, there goes my story. You know, now what? And I'm, I'm, I didn't even know what to ask him. And there was like this pause in the conversation. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? And he said, but. And I thought, oh, boy, here it comes. And he said, there is something called. And he gave me a term, and it has to do with a quirk that occurs not in all string instruments, but in, you know, the occasional string instrument, and could occur in a viola da gamba, and it solved the whole problem. And it was just like, sometimes you just have to be patient, you know, and wait for the, uh, the gods to smile on you and to hand you what you need. So that's what happened. Um, in, in, writing, in, this, in writing this book. And again, it was a question of, well, what if, and what if, and what if? I'll, I'll tell you another. Um, people often say, well, you know, where, where, do I, where do things come from? One of the other hitches in the, in the book was I had to have a reason for a person to be there. Someone coming from another location, uh, far, far away, why would they be in Door County that summer? what would make sense and i had no idea again without adding a lot of coincidences which readers don't like and i'm trying to figure it out and i'm driving to dark county and i pass a road sign and there was one word on that road sign and it gave me the answer 
So sometimes you just, you just don't know and you have to just be open to whatever and bingo. So my problems were solved. The last book that was published, Death by the Bay. I'm gonna take a sip of water, excuse me. We have a book that came from the setting, a book that came from the characters, a book that came from plot, a book that came from a combination of setting and, and an idea from you know way back when. What makes this book, Death by the Bay, totally different from all the other books in the series is that it is based on a true story. My mother grew up on a farm in north central Wisconsin and she was the one of the older daughters in a large family of a Polish immigrant family and they lived in a community with a lot of Polish immigrants in this one particular area. Um, they were people who had no experience with anything American. They barely spoke the language and um, you know, everything was intimidating to them. They came from a culture where you respected authority. Authority carried a lot of sway. And when I was about 10 or 12, I remember asking my mother about this one woman. I, I, we used to go to church on Sunday in this little church in the country, and there were all of the older ladies all dressed in black. And one of them, um, my mother told me, everybody had like big families, except she only had one child. And what had happened was this child was disabled, a little girl. And a doctor came to the farm, their farm, and said that he would be able to help. If they, but he had to take her to his clinic or school. And they signed, the parents signed whatever document this man handed them and took the child and they never saw her again. I, I was just horrified. I thought, how, you know, and then my mother told me that her, one of her younger sisters, my aunt Rose, was, uh, she had um, polio as an infant. Guess what happened? The same man came to my grandparents' farm, said the same thing, made the same offer, and my grandmother, God love her, picked up a broom, chased the guy out of the house, chased him all the way to the road. What happened to that girl? Was that man a doctor? Who knows? And whatever happened to her was not good. This, this we know. So I always, always, always wanted to write that story. I wanted to write it as a nonfiction writer, but how? I mean, would there be any trail? What? It was impossible. I de finally decided as I was working on my Dave Kubiak mysteries that as hard as it might be, I was going to use that in one of the books. But in order to do it, because that was something from the past, I, I mean, obviously I had to move the characters to Dark County. I had to change a lot of the circumstances. But I needed something going on in the present that would parallel that so I, so I could get into the story. And I couldn't find it. I just couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't figure out what, what could be going on in, in this day and age that, that would provide me with that kind of a link. And I'm flipping through the newspaper. I always read papers and magazines and I clip things. I have stacks of clips and I go through them periodically. But um, I'm flipping through the newspaper and I saw a headline that just stopped me cold. And it was a link between, it said that, that they had found a link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. And I thought, that's it. That's a modern concern, you know, a, a disease, a, 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 a disability, if you will, that is a disorder, just a condition, uh, Down syndrome that everyone is familiar with, and Alzheimer's, that is a huge, huge concern. And that was my entry into them being able to, to link these two concepts. Again, a lot of research. Um, I'll tell you just one of the things I learned was that there were absolutely zero 
controls or guidelines on medical research until the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And children, children were considered ideal subjects because they were plentiful in orphanages and in, you know, in the way back when in hospitals for the indigent. And, you know, they, nobody cared. It was really horrible, well, you know, and, and so I, I'm, anyway, I'm probably giving away a lot of the plot here, but <laughs> uh, it was a tough story to write because it, it had a real personal connection, but I wanted to write it. And um, when I did my first talk afterwards, uh, it was at a bookstore in Madison where the book launch was held. And one of, there was a young woman in the audience and she said, um, that she had relatives who lived in another town totally different from where my relatives were from and certainly nothing like the, the made-up town that I use in this book um, and something similar had happened to you know to, to someone that they knew so it, it was not um, it, was, it was it was fiction but it really was based on, on kind of the horrible realities that that exist in our world um, so those are the five books. Um, how do I, oh, which brings me to Dave Kubiak. And I mentioned before, I guess I should say that, let me back up a little bit. Each book, each of these books can stand alone. They are connected because they have the same characters, you know, Dave Kubiak and his kind of cohorts. If, if you ever, if you're a writer and you go to writers' conferences, you always hear people talk about the story arc. And the story arc is essentially like a, like a play, three acts, act one, act two, act three. It's beginning, middle, end. That, that's the whole thing. How, you know, what is the problem? How is the protagonist going after it? And then how is it resolved? So each book, because it, it stands alone, each book has its own story arc. But the series has an arc. And the series is Dave Kubiak's journey of personal redemption. Because I, as I said at the beginning, he started in such a bad place. Um, I couldn't leave him there. How do I get him out of it? Um, I thought the only way I could do that if I was going to write a series was that I had to move the stories through time. So book one, Dave Kubiak is 42, and the second book he's 44, and the third book he's 46. So he's getting older, just like us. Everybody around him is changing. Their life circumstances are changing. Um, and that was a decision I made. And then once you start it, you have to kind of keep going with it. And, and I didn't realize that it would make the writing a lot more challenging. But it also makes sense for for what I was trying to accomplish. So what's Kubiak like? When you meet him in the first book, right on the first page, first of all, you find out he hates being in Door County. He's probably the only person there who doesn't want to be there. His whole goal is to leave. He made a commitment to his former partner who convinced him to go take this job. He made a commitment to stay for a year. So he's been there for three months. He's got nine months to go, and he is out of there. Well, <laughs> it's a series. He can't leave, right? So um, what happens is that there are people dying under mysterious circumstances. Everybody's trying to make an excuse for it because they have, you know, they're, they don't want to scare the tourists away, which is a valid concern. He knows something's going on, but he is not going to get involved. It's not his problem. He's, he's a bit of a drunk. He's morose. He's a loner. He doesn't want anything to do with anybody. He's rude when he does talk to people. He's not a very likable character. Now, I, mean, I probably should have taken a class in how to write a likable protagonist, but you know, I needed him to have a reason to be there. And so I gave him all, these, all this baggage. Um, he has this moment of truth, of course realizes that he has a responsibility to serve and protect. He knows that he, he knows something's going on and he knows, he, you know, if he puts his mind to it, he's, he's going to figure it out. And sure enough, he does. Um, and then he's elected sheriff. So he 
he then becomes the sheriff and, and, and the rest of the books go on from there. What I did not expect to happen um, was that people really relate to him. Um, people who have had kind of um, loss in grief that he did have said to and they sympathize and that what he endures is what, what they're going through. I mean, I had a woman who sent me an email from California and she said his story is, is her story. I had um, an email from a man in Connecticut who had worked with sailors at the Great Lakes Naval Base. And he, he must have been in, the, well, it was a hospital, so he, he worked there. And he said that he thought Kubiak's story was a story of hope for people who had endured great trauma. And I was, I was so touched by this. I was, you know, I, I didn't expect and um, I want, want to know, is he okay? People give me advice on what, you know, should he have a romantic relationship with this person or that person? And, you know, that they, they really, um, he's become real to them. And I, I have to say that at the beginning, when I was trying to, to, um, to find a publisher, and it was very discouraging, the whole industry was kind of collapsing in on itself. And, you know, people in New York were like, well, Wisconsin, who cares? You know, I'm in the Midwest, uh, it's a flyover country, that sort of thing. And I was ready to give up. And there were a couple of reasons why I didn't. The book sat there, literally, on, my, on a shelf in my office for a couple of years, gathering dust. And I was, I was going to just, I was cleaning out my office one day, I was going to toss it. I started flipping through it. And by then I had... You know, I, I knew enough about how to edit my own stuff. And I was, I thought, you know, this is, this is, this is actually pretty good. You know, and I'd flip a page and I'd read a little bit. And I'd think, well, this isn't bad. You know, this. And then I, then I realized that I knew my characters. I would recognize them walking down the street. I knew them that well. And then I thought, I am the only person in the whole world who knows this story. And if I don't tell it, it's never going to get told. And then, of course, the clincher was that I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, and the good nuns told you if you started something, you finished it. So <laughs> I was stuck. I had, to, I had to give it one more go-round, whether I wanted to or not. So I pulled that manuscript off the shelf. I went through it with... I work on a computer when I'm writing, but when I edit, I have to have a hard copy in front of me. And I went through it. I gave it another edit, I did another, you know, ran it through the computer once more, incorporated more changes, and went to a conference where they were talking about local, buying local, shopping local. Uh, and I thought, well, if you buy groceries local, why not look local for publishers? Because the big five was, you know, in New York, and they were all like, there, there used to be the big 12, and now it had become the big five. Um, I didn't even realize that there were all these independent publishers all over the place. I don't, I don't know what, why, um, but I got a list of 14 publishers and I started going to their websites and seeing who published what and some didn't do fiction and some did. And the University of Wisconsin Press was on there. And of course, it's basically an academic press, but they do fiction. And they had a mystery or two in their you know, catalog. And I thought, well, you know, my story's set in Wisconsin, why not move them to the top of the list? And that's what I did. I sent a query email on a Friday afternoon. I got a response within an hour. I thought, I am not even going to look at this because I know it's going to be, you know, thanks, but no thanks, blah, 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 you know, the usual. And um, I went for a walk, I vacuumed the rug. And then, of course, I opened the email. <laughs> and it said... This sounds interesting. Please send full manuscript. And the rest has been history. So, in a nutshell, that's the story of the Dave Kubiak Dark County Mysteries. And I would be delighted to answer any questions or talk more. <laughs> um, I'll, while I'm unmuting everybody, um, Trisha, there was a comment made in the chat that 
they want a person wanted to know what was that word that you saw on the sign as you were traveling through Door County. If you can tell us that. This Denmark, town up near Green Bay, and the name of the town is Denmark, Denmark, Wisconsin. And that gave me the clue to what I needed. It, it told me how I had to get that, that one character here. Okay. Because it, there were, well, whatever. I, I can't say too much because it gives away the whole story. Sure, sure. Are there other questions that people may have? I have a question. I have a question. Um, had you submitted the manuscript to other publishers before, or was this the first time you actually submitted the manuscript? Oh, I submitted it to agents and publishers all over the place, yeah. And I went to like a pitch conference in, in New York and, and, you know, pitched directly to editors who said, oh yeah, wonderful, send it to us. Six weeks later, they were out of the business. I mean, it was just very, very frustrating. Um, so yeah, I, I had. Uh, I guess the lesson there is you can't give up. <laughs> I have a, a comment to make, and, and that is uh, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. I thought it was very interesting. Um, my husband has been writing an, uh, an endless novel for seven years. <laughs> yeah, he's right here, and I think he uh, uh, was encouraged by some of the things you said, too. Um, yes. Yes. Great. We are both mystery lovers and we have not read your series and um before uh this evening even we decided that we were going to start your series and and uh read them so we're looking forward to that thank you thank you very much and don't you know just keep plugging away because you never know and the other thing is is if you're not i mean i would suggest uh, a critique group is helpful workshops are helpful and any, anything that, that kind of gives you encouragement and, and moves you along in, in what you're working on, is, I would suggest that you pursue that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I, you talked about plot and character and setting. Uh, what's the uh, latest book? Where does, that, where does that get inspired by? Ah, okay. Um, the latest book was inspired, uh, and the title, the working title is Death Washes Ashore. And that came from two people, two ideas. One, there was a big storm in Door County a couple of years ago, really harsh storm, and a boat ended up on the shore, flipped over. And one of my beach neighbors sent me an email. He's, he's a fan of the books. And um, he, he said, oh, did you hear about the boat? And he said, wouldn't it be funny if there was a body under it? Ha, 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 you know. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. And I think, oh, well, maybe, you know. So that was part of it. And the other thing is that uh, I have a daughter. I, my daughter is in Milwaukee, and my other daughter lives on the East Coast. And she was telling me about something called live action role playing, which is LARPing. And I knew about um, Civil War reenactments, but LARPing is very different. LARPing is like, you know, Star Wars and medieval and fantasy. It's, it can be anything you want it to be. And I thought, oh, well, how about uh -huh. there was a LARPing center on Dork, you know, in Door County? And somehow, mm, you know, so those two ideas. Um, so it's not, those were... Yeah, it's not really, I guess, setting, you could say, in a bit, because it was the beach, you know, with the body under the boat, and and then and then just this whole kind of concept of characters running around pretending to be other characters, you know, real pretending to be, to live, to be living a fantasy life of one sort or another. Well, so that's where that book came from. I have a question. Um, Knowing that I was going to be a part of this, I and I had never read any of your books. I did read um, Death in Cold Water, so I've started with that one, and now I'm uh, I finished that, and are moving on to uh, Death Rides a Ferry. But I had a question about Death in Cold Water. There, there's a lot of um, um, uh, reference to the goal. Uh, excuse me. The Green Bay Packers, and I just wondered if, when when you 
use them in that way, do you have to get permission from them? Or can you just sort of make up <laughs> stories? You know, the, the, one of the characters was real connected to the Green Bay Packers. And I just wondered, can you just do that? Or do you have to ask for permission to, you know, well, talk about well, them? And Well, the Green Bay Packers are, you know, they're, they're a public entity. You're right. About, they have publicity, you know, you, you don't have to get permission to write about the Green Bay Packers. And um, the character that was connected, that I connected to them, you know, everything about his connection to them in terms of, of you know, owning the shares and all that, I mean, that, that all, that's what happens. I mean, everybody, I know someone who has one share in the Green Bay Packers. I mean, sure. Publicly owned company. And the history, the history of the Packers there's a little bit of history woven into the story. That's all true. That's all accurate. But this character, um, I just completely made up. Um, but some of the things that happened, in, you know, about like they, when the team in the old days was really, really on, on the skids and, and, and going, you know, they had no money um, mm -hmm. and, and people did bail them out. So I just happened to make him one of those people. But no, I, I, there was no need to get permission for that. I just had to be careful. Oh, this was what important. Um, and well, I originally gave that one particular character a name that happened to be kind of similar to someone who's who was really closely affiliated with the team. Uh -huh. And some of someone in the production department at the University of Wisconsin Press picked up on that and said, "Ooh, you got to change this guy's name <laughs> because the name was the name would have caused issues because it was a bit it was." it was similar to someone else's name. So that was a good catch. So something like that, you have to be careful of. You can't, you can't do something, you know, your character, whether they're doing something good or bad, who, who a living person could think that you're talking about them or their relative. You have to be careful about that. Thank you. That answers the question. Yeah. We, we lost you for a moment yeah, there. I have another question. You were, you were kind of freezing up and I on my screen oh, okay. it said that our internet um, bandwidth is low. So I, I apologize to people if, if they didn't get every sentence there in that last um, answer. But okay. is, is it okay now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I have a question, kind of about the publishing world and how authors actually get paid. Um, do you get paid up front and then do you get paid so much for every book that's sold or how does that all work? Um, <laughs> theoretically, no, you do get paid for the books that are sold. Um, it, it's, it's a system of royalties and every company has a different way of, um, you know, th there's a standard contract that they use. And of course, on the standard contract, the publisher gets the lion's share of everything. And um, you just have to kind of negotiate. But, but it, it's, a, it's a question of, of how the books are sold. And, and it's a hugely complicated business because there's distributors, there's many, many layers. It's a, if you have a pie, and you, and you cut pieces of the pie, um, probably the author gets one of the smaller pieces of the pie. But <laughs> with, with, a, with a traditional publisher, there's a lot of expenses. I mean, they're, you know, they've got, they have people to pay, they, they're, they're producing the book, they, they, they don't get the biggest chunk of the pie either necessarily, because there's a lot of people who are involved um, in getting the book from from point A to, to a bookshelf somewhere. Um, it, it, but one of the things that happens is that um, you negotiate your contracts. If you have an agent, your agent does it for you. Um, I didn't have an agent, I was unagented, and, but I belong to the Authors Guild. So when I got my first contract, I sent it to them to look at their legal department and they vetted it for me. And they sent me, oh, like this long list of, you know, ask for this, ask for that, this isn't good, this is good. And, um, but they said, pick out the six or seven things that really mean something to you and go for those. So here I am 
desperate to have my book published, right? This is what, this is where every author finds himself in, or almost every author, you know, you've spent years writing the, the book and you've spent years trying to sell it. And then finally someone says, we want to publish it. And they give you a contract that you think, mm, you know, this could be a little better. And <laughs> so I took all the advice that I was given by the Authors Guild and I typed up my response saying, Oh, wonderful. I'm so delighted that you're interested. Now, this is what I want. You know, point A, point B, point C, all the way through. And then I hit send, and I thought, oh, boy, I have shot myself in the foot. They're going to say, who does she think she is? You know, this prima donna, we don't want to have anything to do with her. I got every single thing I asked for. Very important lesson for the gentleman who's working on his book, stick to your guns. <laughs> and then, um, so I had a contract for three books. And when it came time for book four, they said, oh, let's extend the contract. And I said, oh, how about if we have a new one? <laughs> let's make it even a little, you know, trust me. No, you know, I'm not running to the bank. Um, and I haven't bought any islands lately. Um, but you know, you keep kind of, you know, you, you just ask for a little bit more. And all they can do is say no. The one good thing that I did do is I maintained the film and all the, 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 the film and TV rights. So if anybody out there knows a producer, <laughs> send my email. Um, because if anything happens, then, then, I'm in, then, then I get to benefit from it rather than the press. Otherwise, I get like another tiny slice of the pie. Although, who knows how that pie is sliced up anyway. <laughs> I have a question uh, regarding uh, your, your locale. Because Door County is uh, one that, um, much like Cumberland, it's, it's a small area. There's a limited number of people. Uh, people know everybody else, um, and also places. So how you you mentioned over your writings, you mentioned some restaurants or bars uh, or shops. Uh, did you use any that actually existed, or were they all fictitious? And how about characters? Did you, did you do you get any pushback uh, from the residents of Door County about the characters that you choose? Because um, some of them perhaps may have been too close to, for them anyway, to, to uh, themselves. Okay, that's a, a nice series of questions. That's, you know, when, when, I, when I was doing the first book, I talked to um, my editor and I said, should I use the real names of the towns? Should I not? He said, it's up to you. I thought, oh, great. So I, I went and looked at a number of different books and, you know, mysteries. And how did other authors handle this? And what I realized was that they would usually, like if you're naming a big city, Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, you use it. If you're, if you're naming a small town, you make up the name of it. Um, I decided that because so many people are familiar with Door County that I would, and again, writing a series, once you make this decision, you have to stick with it. You know, you have to, this is what you live with. So my decision was that I would use the real names of the towns, I would use the obviously the real names of the bodies of water, and I would use the two route, you know, Highway 42 and Highway 57, and everything else I would make up. You know, I would, I would, and I, I would say a county road, and I wouldn't even name it because you don't want someone to say, oh, that's my farm, or you know, that's not right. And and the thing about a business, you don't want to you even in a place like Door County, where some of these businesses have been there for generations things change you know the the local local diner in town that had been there forever suddenly got sold and it has a new name so if you use the original name the real name suddenly you're wrong you know when it changes and another really popular eatery um, was sold and it's now a drugstore in its location so so you have to be really careful about that plus you don't want to like um, have a dead body show up in somebody's you know back room of a, a store or something that's not really good for business. So um, those were the decisions I made that I would use the names of the towns and like the state park 
um, the names of the, the lakes, Green Bay and Lake Michigan and the smaller lakes, but not, um, not businesses. And, and in terms of the people, um, no, there hasn't been any pushback. The only thing is that in the first book, there's a, a conflict between people who, uh, between people's definition of progress, you know, what should be done and, and, and what shouldn't be done. And one woman who um, had been in business there for many, many years said, oh, she said, it's like you were, you were a fly on the wall during these meetings we have, you know, because there is a lot of, of you know, contention about, about what, what constitutes a way forward and, and what other people don't want. So um, when the first book came out, um, and I think this, this, is, this is like, this explains how the reception was in Door County. My book launch was co-sponsored by um, a longstanding bookstore and the Door County Library, you know, in Sturgeon Bay. So I, I thought I was in pretty good paper. And, and there, hasn't been, there, there hasn't been any negative feedback, except for one reader who, I had the lilacs blooming in the wrong month for her, so she was not happy with that. But other than that, there hasn't been a problem. I have one more question. Um, do you read other mysteries written by other people? Or has the fact that you're now a mystery writer, does it just kind of take the fun out of reading other people's stories? I love to read mysteries. I've always read them. Um, I tend to not read them when I'm working on a manuscript, though. I especially do not read any that are set anywhere in the Midwest because, um, you know, it's just too easy to like, oh, is that like my description or their description, mm -hmm. idea or their idea? And I don't, I don't want to be overly influenced. Um, but yes, I, I love to read mysteries and, and um, uh, I've always read them. So that's probably why I've always uh, wanted to, to write them. I, I think mysteries are not just whodunits, you know. I, I really think a good mystery is, um, is a window into, into human character. And that's one of the things I try to do is um, to, to probe the, the, the motivation. Why does somebody do something? I mean, murder is the most heinous crime you can commit. There's, there's no going back. These are not crimes of passion in, in, in my books. The, you know, these, are, these are things people have plotted out and, and, and they justify it. How do you justify that? Well, people do. And what I want my readers to understand is um, how, how they got to that point where they feel that they are okay doing this, or that it's a good thing or, it's a positive, or they're justified in doing it. And what I'm kind of hoping is that readers will then think, hmm, what would I do in that situation? I mean, we're all capable of being, you know, saying then sinners. Um, what would it take to push someone to the edge? What would it, what, what would you, what would you do if you were like in the second book, there's, there are people, three women who endured deceit and treachery for decades. And then, how do you react to that? How would you react to it? I don't know. Um, so that that's kind of what I what I like to do. I, I don't know. Does that answer your question, Linda? Oh yes. Yeah. Do you have a favorite mystery writer? Oh, I have lots of them. Um, I like Kate Atkinson. She had a series of of books of, with um, her protagonist. Uh, Jackson Brody, who was kind of a wounded guy too, and I like Sarah Paretsky. I like uh, historical fiction. I like Ellen First. He has wonderful World War II novels that are just spy and espionage, and um, you know, just just a lot of them. I, I like to read a variety of them, but I tend to read um, the the darker literary and, and darker kinds of, of books. I I. That those are the mysteries that appeal to me. And one of my favorite books was Gorky Park by Martin Cruz Smith. I just thought that was a marvelous, marvelous book. And um, yeah, so I do read them. Okay. And uh, Penny, Louise Penny. I like hers too. With her, uh, in, um, what is oh. this? I can't. 
The Three Pines Mysteries. Um, yes, The Three Pines Mysteries, yes. In, in that, yeah. And she created a great, great little town, a community for those. Mm -hmm. I do like to read her. Yeah. I, I have a question about uh, characters, and you have a few uh, re supporting characters for your, Dave. Uh, and one is the retired uh, coroner, uh, Dr. Bathard. How, um, what went into the development of his character? I wanted, now, Kubiak's father was basically a drunk and a cynical kind of Un, you know, just just uh, an unsuccessful, unhappy man. And I wanted a character who would be the complete opposite of that. Someone that would most serve as a father figure who became, he was the first person to befriend Kubiak, who reached out to him and kind of, I think, had a sense of what this man was dealing with. And the relationship that kind of develops over time, I think, at least in my head, is that Kubiak looks at Bethard as kind of um, the kind of father he never had and, and respects him and, and, and learns from him of, of what, how different people could be, that you don't have to be this mean, nasty, cynical kind of human being um, that he was exposed to growing up. And the, what, the interesting thing is that in the second book, Kubiak had to have needed access to a fast book, so I introduced Mike Rao. Uh, this hotshot deputy who, who he and his buddies have this boat and Kubiak gets to use it and or they take him where he needs to be and that's that's the only reason I introduced Rao is because I need because because Kubiak needed this boat and in the third book Rao takes on a much larger role and becomes almost accidentally and so here's Kubiak in the middle and he's got kind of this father figure and then he becomes almost a, a mentor, a, a, almost kind of a father figure to Mike Rao. And that just kind of happened. And there's even a line in there where Kubiak calls him, are you okay, son? Because Rao has to do something that's really hard and horrendous. And he says it in the way that, you know, an older man might say to a younger man, but he also says it in the way a father would say to a son, are you okay, son? And it, it, it just happened, you know, characters do kind of take on a life of their own. We have one more question. Uh, our Zoom time is going to automatically end at eight o'clock. So I want to be conscious of that and not just disappear all of a sudden. Um, any last questions? Oh, I had one. Uh, the uh, the, the Louise Penny stories, for example, I have not read yours, but I plan to. But uh, one of the things I like about hers is that the, the characters have more depth than some of the mystery writers' characters seem to have 75 years or so ago, who are often highly praised, but I find them boring. And I, I like the uh, the depth of uh, many modern mystery writers, I guess, for character and you might say theme as well. Uh, maybe you already have addressed that <laughs> with your other comments, but I wonder if you have anything more to say about that. Just say that fashions change, you know, in books and, and everything else, and there are trends. And yeah, that, that hard-hitting... Um, you know, smart alecky kind of detective. He had a time and a place, and it, it's gone. Um, but yeah, I think they're. I think they they have a, a. They're more. They're more. They they do. They have. They're they're human. They're more human. They they you know they they have more of an emotional life than they used to have. And I think that that's just um, a. a an issue of the time and it may be because more mysteries are being written by women and maybe women just have more of a feel for that dorothy dorothy sarah's novel her mysteries always had characters who had depth and feeling i mean lord peter whimsy in the relationship you know with harriet vane 
I thought that was, those were marvelous. And, and the one where, where it's, it's the busman's holiday, he suffered, you know, when, when Wisby suffered knowing that he had sent a man to the gallows. And, and that really, that's one of the things that touched me as a young reader. Um, when I read that book, I, and that's, that's where I got this idea of a mystery could be a, a window into human character, because I saw that in, in what she did. And, and in Wisby's relationship with his, with his bunter, you know, the, the, the man who'd saved his life in the war. I mean, there was a real human connection. So whether it's because some of the authors are women, I don't know. Um, but I do think that a lot of it is just that, that um, uh, fashions change and fashions and stories and what's, what's wanted and acceptable and popular. I'm Good, glad you mentioned you. that, though, because I wanted to also tell you how much I appreciate the growth of your characters, because I read a lot of mysteries, and that doesn't happen in, in every series. Sometimes it's just the same, you know, they, they never mm -hmm. age, they never uh, discover new feelings or uh, develop new relationships. So thank you for having your characters grow up. Oh, you're welcome. That's that was one of the things I was trying to accomplish. So it's it's good to know that it, it comes through. Yeah, you have been an absolutely marvelous audience. This has been delightful. I'm so sorry that I'm sitting here in front of a computer screen and not you know actually in the room with all of you. But uh, um, but then again, some of you wouldn't have been there because you're in places other than uh, um, northern Wisconsin. So. Uh, but I will come to Cumberland someday. I will visit your beautiful library and maybe we'll all have a cup of tea or a glass of wine or something together. <laughs> maybe when the next book comes out, it will be out in the, hopefully in the spring. So if you, if you're looking for an author to fill a slot, keep me in mind. I'd be happy to do it. Absolutely. We will. Thank you so much for your interesting and wonderful presentation and for taking the time to answer all of our questions so thoroughly. Really appreciate it and really appreciate your sponsorship, uh, Bruce. This wouldn't have happened without you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Very good. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Very worthwhile. Thanks again, Patricia. Oh, my pleasure. I really did enjoy it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.